Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by Die Hard. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you very much, Alec Webb, for giving us that great introduction. Hello, everyone. I am John Davis. Welcome to Motor Week Podcast number 106. And joining me in our Studio C around our unusually shaped uh, conference table is our writer, producer, and two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. What's up, John? Our road test producer, Ben Davis. Great to be here, John. Our assistant producer, Greg Carlos. What is up? And our writer, Patrick Lucas. Let the bell speak for me. <laughs> the bell speaks for itself. Speaks for Patrick. Okay, we've got our lightning round of your question coming up. But first, let's get to the cause. And we have our first one we're going to talk about is, um, well, some people have called it revolutionary. I think we have. The 2015 Ford F-150, the first full-size pickup truck, and for that matter, the first pickup truck that I'm aware of, with a body made of all aluminum. And uh, at this point, I should note that we have uh, Ford has not released the official fuel economy numbers yet. They may by the time you actually hear this, but they're talking about five to twenty percent improvement in fuel economy, depending on the powertrain. And they're obviously trying to beat the uh, Dodge Ram uh, diesel uh, on highway economy. With that said, Ben, you've had the most experience in the F one fifty. What do you think? Yeah. Aluminum going to work? You know, yeah, of course. It'll work. It'll it'll definitely save fuel economy. But something that uh, Brian Robinson brought up is Whoa, that who is that? <laughs> you said that magnetic signs aren't going to stick. That's to right. It. And I never thought about oh, that yeah, until I read that. That's the first thing that everybody pops <laughs> in a lot of people's minds. Supposedly, at the preview, Ford didn't say they had a cure for that because I no. understand they had something up their sleeve. I don't know if it's something sticky or hopefully something. they do. I mean, you wouldn't think that's a big deal, but for fleet use, sure. small business, that's a pretty big deal. Anyway, I spent a lot of time in the two point seven liter Eco Boost. Um, that's the new engine, the two seven. The that's the smaller of the Eco Boost yeah. offerings, yeah. And it had plenty of power. It, it had enough torque for you know for towing uh, toys and uh, for for de- pretty decent sized payloads. Um, effortlessly, it, it effortlessly shifted to. There was no hunting for gears or anything. Um, I mean, that's an incredible amount of horsepower and torque for a base motor of that size. Yeah, that's the one. I guess they're thinking is going to be the uh, the fuel economy champ. I guess I would have to be. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the torque like real close to the V8 or something? Like, it's, I, I can't remember actual numbers, but it is. I, th- I believe it is pretty similar with, yeah, it makes to the you, five liter. You, yeah, you really have to put in some thought, I think, before you make up your mind whether you go with a naturally aspirated V8 or V6 or an EcoBoost because they're putting well, out so much people torque. people have already made that decision. They have, you know, most F-150s today, the steel body ones, have a six-cylinder engine, either the uh, the larger EcoBoost or the normally aspirated base motor. So it's, I think that decision's made. It's nice to still have that five liter, though, for yeah. people that are skeptical about turbocharged sure. motors. But what about the aluminum body? It still has a steel frame, Mm -hmm. even though I understand it's a super high-strength steel. I mean, do you think the public is ready for an aluminum body pickup truck? I mean, Ford has some experience with when they own Jaguar and Land Rover building small batches. But we're talking 700,000. We're talking the most popular vehicle uh, in America. What do you think? Is aluminum where it's going to be for pickup trucks? Yeah, eventually. I mean, that's where it's going. I I don't think most people care. I mean, if you asked – the majority of current F-150s owners, what uh, you know, what their truck was made out of, they probably wouldn't even know. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've seen so many pickup trucks on the road that are just like horribly dented and banged up. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if you're using it for work and you're not carrying a sign all, uh, all over it, you don't really care how it looks. You just want it to get the job done. So I agree with Brian. I don't think they'll even notice. I know Ford told you, and we've seen some uh, some tests, that uh, the this the aluminum, which is, you know, it's not beer cans, folks. Uh, the <laughs> aluminum is, is actually it's thicker. Grade. Oh, it's yeah. military grade, and it actually resists dents better than steel, than the old steel body. Yeah, I mean, they're making uh, steel bodies on all cars so thin, you can yeah. dent them with a pencil practically if you bump into it wrong. One uh, person that I talked to uh, had a current F-150 that he's been lowering a, uh, backing a boat in, down to a boat ramp for 20 years or something, and again, the whole back end of the truck's rusted out. <laughs> and I told him that you know, the body won't rust out, but you know, the frame is still made of steel. So if, if that's what you're doing with the truck, you still might have a problem. But the uh, you know They've also announced that the... Uh, 
the uh, Super Duty is going to be all aluminum, too. And I know for a fact that some fleets are a little nervous about it, and I think because not only the durability aspect, but I think for the assurance aspect. Uh, I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. But on the other hand, if you're the typical truck buyer and you've laid down now, what is it, $40,000 plus for the typical full-size pickup, are you going to worry about another 100 bucks uh, every six months for insurance? I think you're going to take the savings in fuel economy and, and just roll the dice on, on the uh – on whether or not you're ever going to get into an accident. You know, that's actually the that's a good point. So it probably balance out. Yeah. I, I don't want to get too heavy. But no. uh, <laughs> what's the deal? Have they talked about, uh, like, crash ratings and, like, crashing it in safety? How it's going to fail uh, on that? There's no – they haven't really said too much, but they're expecting to do very well. And, of course, the aluminum body cars out there right now uh, from Audi and so forth, they do very well. So there's no particular reason to think that that's going to – Suffer. Yeah, um, it has more to do with frame structure yeah. and crush zones and stuff like that than body, I think. And when you look at the CAFE standards, even if um, you know there's some big change in Washington, they're pretty much cemented in stone from till 2020. And I think aluminum is going to be successful here. I think others going to adopt it. And I think it's going to be a very short period of time before you see it on uh, larger SUVs. So I think aluminum's coming for the heavier vehicles. Well, we'll soon see. A new F-150. Uh, lots going to be in the news about it now that it's in production over the next uh, uh, six months or so. And I imagine they're up for an awful lot of awards, so we'll see how that plays out. Now let's do something completely different. Um, recently, we've had a chance to experience both the McLaren P1 and the LaFerrari, two undoubtedly super, super cars. All right. Some of us have been in one. Some of us have been in none. Uh, Patrick, <laughs> Greg, you've probably had the most experience with these two cars. If you had to duel uh, between these two cars, what would you? What some of the attributes, pluses and minuses? Who wins? Um, well, if you're looking for, you know, if you're going to take your P1 or LaFerrari out on the street, I think uh, LaFerrari, in my opinion, is probably the better street car um, because it has a, a several different driving modes with other Ferraris, other cars. But um, it actually handles terrain really, really well. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem like you're driving a supercar uh, if you're going over bumps. I mean, you obviously feel how stiff it is, but it's nothing compared to what old supercars used to be, or even the McLaren P1. Um, so it's pretty docile. The, yeah, it, it yeah. The, it's be. it's pretty incredible what they can do with the, those uh, damping rates. Um, but the McLaren is a little rougher on the road, and um, in terms of, I, personally, I would shy towards LaFerrari and. Pretty much every aspect. I'm not a huge McLaren fan. Doesn't mean I dislike it. It's just uh, I would go with LaFerrari. Um, I would have to agree. I mean, <coughs> bless you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the McLaren is just like super, super stiff. I mean, it yeah, was, I agree with that. I mean, it was just like an otherworldly kind of <laughs> like driving. A race car. Yeah, I mean, and I was surprised at how loud it was. I mean, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I was thinking hybrid. You know, it's it's going to be like subdued a little bit. No, that thing sounds crazy loud, really stiff. Um, Are you talking in terms of I, I, the roads we were driving on had a lot of like loose rocks, loose stones. Well, yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm that just thing just that like has exhaust and engine. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's absolutely no sound in the yeah, yeah, one. It's all carbon fiber. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah. super. You can hear that thing. Uh, it's it's crazy. It's so yeah, loud. But um, I was shocked at how much smaller the P1. Mm -hmm. It was than the LaFerrari. LaFerrari's a big car. Yeah, like yeah, the garage door opened, um, and I saw the LaFerrari, and I was like, wow, that thing looks like almost double the width of the P1 or something like that. The P1 is truly like a, a race, or much more of a race car-ish than the LaFerrari, I think. Uh, yeah, ever since uh, the Enzo, um, you know, Ferrari's been building these super, super cars that are just so easy to drive it's kind of scary really that they're so easy to drive yeah they're both uh you know similar in that they're over 900 horsepower hybrid powertrains which uh you know it's kind of new now which in that. itself is yeah. kind of freaky when you start rolling it and it makes no noise at all so so are we declaring the la ferrari the winner uh, if you ask me i think yeah i think it's the winner in terms of styling <laughs> interior uh, driving everything for me is is La Ferrari. All right. Well, well I think like unless that. yeah, unless you want to go strictly counterculture and be all like you know, I have a McLaren, not a Ferrari. You're gonna want the La Ferrari. That's me then. I'll, so. take, I'll take the P1. Then. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> one at your Listen summer your home, underground one at your music. winter home. 
Okay, speaking of uh, performance, but a totally different elk, the 2015 Dodge Charger. And we also want to talk a little bit about the Hellcat. Ben, you want to start us off? I, drew, I got a chance to drive the Hellcat on our uh, our home track, actually, uh, Summit Point. Um, and I'm very glad to say that it's not the kind of car that's going to, much like the 911 Turbo, will make you look like a superhero, even though your skills quite aren't to that level. The Hellcat will let you have a, well, the Hellcat's going to, it'll hold your hand and pull you out of some situations if you're really messing up. But it's more of a driver's car than, ah, it's hard to say it's more of a driver's car than an i11 turbo, but in some ways it is. Is that just a the 707 like a, horsepower? Is it more of a, is it something like else? a skilled driver's car, or like because you don't have to be super skilled in the 911, like you were saying. It's, right, you can you can pretty much have a, a basic idea of where you need to be on the track, but if you, regardless of your throttle input or anything on a 911, you're gonna look. It's gonna pull you out and make you look amazing. Whereas the Hellcat really won't do that. You gotta have a sense to know what you're doing on the track to really uh, handle this car, and it. And I, I kind of like that. But you also said that it doesn't feel like seven. If you're driving it normally, it doesn't feel like 700 horsepower. No, you can zip out to the mall and it. it's it's really tame on the street. You can even dial it down to 500 horsepower if you really. Oh, well, you probably <laughs> yeah, it has the same thing. You can do like red key, black key type yeah, deal. Exactly. Yeah. We've got this um, uh, five seven. Uh, 2015 the rt uh, out the there RT, the rt the charger in the lot and that's a a very nice car i mean you know, it's got the, the cylinder cut off it's very docile it still sounds great fuel economy is well within the ballpark it's roomy and comfortable very roomy that's a pretty nice car my only qualms and they did they did the biggest change to their front end styling they've done in almost a decade, the the uh, the big bold what I call pig nose that you know, Rams continues to use that's now been replaced by more of a dart front end, and it's very modern looking, very sophisticated, not quite as aggressive. But you know, the rest of the car is, is the previous body, and it doesn't work. It's like you got this really modern front end and kind of a throwback. That was my exterior. first impression too. Is that oh yeah. man, they made it look like a dart. Yeah, they made it look like a dart, and if you want to do the whole car, that's fine. But I'm not so sure it's successful doing half and half. Uh, as far as driving, I mean, it's a great car to drive. Mm-hmm. It's just a big, comfortable American rear-wheel drive car. Uh, interior, I think, is fantastic. All material quality is good. Uconnect is still one of the best uh, infotainment systems. Uh, gauges are great, super clear, a lot of information. Uh, it's a great everyday driver for sure. Now you can get it in all wheel drive, but you were telling us a story that you don't really have to, do you? Uh, well, I spent some time in uh, last gen Charger uh, in some snow up in Michigan and rear wheel drive car, and it did great. The uh, you know traction system kicks in when you want it to and lets you spin the wheels when you need to as well. So I thought it did great in the snow. The car also has um, a uh, radar, cruise control, and braking system on it, right? Yeah, which we, yeah, we just tested, tested out, that today. out today. <laughs> <laughs> had, a, had a blast with that. Yeah, it uh, it works actually pretty flawlessly and really consistently. Um, from stops 5, 10, 15 miles an hour, it brings you right down to a stop consistently every time. Uh, 20, it'll put on the brakes, but you're still going to tap right. the car in front of you, but not nearly what it would be if you were to hit it at 20 miles an hour. By a car in front of you, in this case, we mean a giant styrofoam replica of a vehicle that we use. <laughs> Which, if, when you watch the uh, video road test of uh, the 2015 Charger, you'll see our new uh, barrier test uh, for testing these uh, automatic uh, braking systems. And uh, we've been playing around with it for the last few months, but this will actually be its uh, debut on the Charger. So uh, something new for us, all of us. All right, let's go on to our lightning round. Uh, we've all got about two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic. When the time's up, uh, Patrick's going to hit the bell, and then we should stop uh, automatically at some point or at least slow down. Okay, there's been an article uh, lately uh, where BMW's head of sales was quoted as saying, quote, the sports car market is roughly half of what it used to be, and he goes on to say that he thinks it won't even, it will never fully rebound. That people are switching their taste in cars from sports cars to heaven forbid SUVs. So, is the traditional sports car going away? Will it just turn into yet another automotive niche, 
or will there be enough demand to bring it back? I mean, after all, we're looking at we have the new Corvette. We've got a new Miata coming out. There's the uh, the uh, Alpha uh, counterpart to us. So what do you think? Are sports cars uh, dying off, or what's going on? I think they are, despite the cars that you just mentioned. What what the industry really needs is to to go back into the subcompact generation that we had in the 80s and the 90s, where you could get uh, low-budget cars that are rear-wheel drive with a manual transmission, like the Corollas and, and such, and cars like, like the that. FRS and the BRZ. Yeah. Well... I, 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 something a little more, <laughs> something a little more with a little more utility than that, hmm. uh, like, the, like the two-door hatchbacks, like a Fiesta ST if that were rear drive. Exactly. Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but more of them. You know, everybody had one back then. Yeah, I think the you know there's always going to be sports cars. There's certainly always going to be a demand for them. The definition may change, and the way you look at them may, it may change. not just I mean, be two seats anymore. No. Yeah, and even the crossovers. I mean, we just had a Macan in, which is technically a crossover, but it's really just a jacked up 911 wagon, and it's got all, almost all the performance of a 911. It's just a little bit of bigger body. I mean, to me, that's a sports car. You can still call it a crossover. I, I think you're absolutely dead on. Yeah. I think it's the definition. He's really talking about. The two-seat Cooper convertible, the traditional, you know, what we call a roadster. Well, as near as I can tell, I didn't hear him actually say it, but when you really look around, there's a lot of stuff that people call sports cars. I mean, they call Mustang and Camaros sports cars, sure, where yeah. technically we, they've got back seats, so they're not, if you're a purist, but they really are. And hatchbacks uh, that have a, a minimal back seat and still have – I mean, we drive average sedans today that would outperform any sports car up until about 20 years ago. So, so How do you think the new Miata is going to be received when it's actually on sale? I think it's going to go over very well because it will be inexpensive probably, at least a, you know the bottom end model will. Uh, the Alpha will probably do very well for a while. I think the question is are these going to be runaway hits and, you know, do 200,000 sports cars a year? The answer is no. Even Corvette, you know, it's going to cool off pretty quick from the first uh, year or two of its sales. So. Brian, you look like you want well, to Well, I was going to talk about, when you're talking about Alpha, just the 4C and the fact that they brought that back. Yeah. I mean, that's, the to me, the definition of a bare-bones sports car. Absolutely. I think if they brought the, Except it's expensive. If they yeah. brought the CRX back, that might yeah. make a movement. Could be. All right, <laughs> thanks. That was, that was fun. <laughs> For the okay. record, I chose to sit that segment out. I didn't want to say anything. Why? We keep I, going to I, was, I was just kidding. Just I, because you're so tall? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> you can't, I don't know. You I don't can't know why I said that. I kind of wish I wouldn't have said comment. that now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good here's one that you can comes. pipe up for. I am still here, by the way. Um, Leroy Stitzer asked uh, one of our viewers, I've been told that people can't get out of their car with a dead battery. He's talking about newer cars like BMWs, Cadillacs, and Mercedes. Is that true? Well, interesting enough, um, this provoked a lot of um, head scratching around the office this morning because we really so hadn't thought usual, about yeah. it. Uh, Leroy and we basically went out to the parking lot and started looking around. And who wants to talk about what we found? I'll start it off. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> Unless you were, I don't know, Greg. Uh, we were both there. Go. Greg, go ahead. Greg, right, you start Greg. since we haven't heard from you. Uh, I sh- shouldn't have said what I said. Uh, yeah. Um, we went out, and what did we have? We had our GTI, which doesn't have the actual mechanical locking mechanism that we're used to seeing pop up out of the door and pop, uh, come back down. But we found that you can get out of of that one, even with you and drive, or if the battery's dead, or, or anything like that. Uh, also, the... GMC Canyon uh, mm-hmm. does have those uh, traditional door traditional, pegs. Yeah. yeah, but they disappear when there's they the do, door and you locked. can't even pull them out. Normally, you could pull them out. I remember right. in, in older cars, uh, this one you can't. But all you have to do there is just pull the door handle once, which will pop the peg back up out of the door, and then pull it again, and you're out. So, I think what we pretty much found is is that there is a way. I think it's just a matter of figuring that way out. And if you're in a BMW, it wouldn't shock me if it's a super hard way to get out of the car. <laughs> Probably, but just familiarize yourself with yeah, it. Yeah, read the owner's so. manual, or more importantly, when you go into the dealer, if that really concerns you, and and frankly, I can understand why it might get the sales consultant to figure it out for you. It's there's no way that there's a car that you can't get out of somehow mechanically uh, if there's a dead battery. On the other hand, people worry about what happens if the 
airbag goes off and you're locked in the car. Every car that I know of that we've seen in the last decade, at least, if not more, if the airbag goes off, the manufacturer states unequivocally that the doors will automatically unlock. So I guess we have to go by what they say. Even cars that don't have B-pillars necessarily, right. and the ones, and in those cases, they kind of drop the window a quarter inch right. when the door opens. That's something to think about. Even those will drop with a dead battery. Yeah. There is a way, if you're locked out of the car, and it, there's no, a lot of cars don't have uh, outside key tumblers anymore. There's, I, I believe there's some kind of mechanism behind the license plate that you can stick a key in and, and turn it, and that will drop your window a quarter inch and unlock your door. Most every car has got some way to get into it from the outside, even if you don't see a key in the driver's door. I guess the, even the keys in the passenger door are starting to go away. Yeah, That's why they have the Google machine on your phones now. You can figure yeah. anything out. Or just make sure your battery doesn't go dead. That yeah. is an idea. That's the best thing that stuff do. happens, though, Brian. Yeah, it, does. I mean, it happens. Do it they happens. just Sympathy. die? I mean, usually you can tell when no. your battery's going. Well, you can have a battery explode. I've had that happen to me. So they can die overnight. You know, they can die. You can. Yeah. I was basically. I'll never forget. I was up in uh, somewhere going to, in a uh, in a. I won't name the car anymore because it wasn't their fault. <laughs> but I'm driving along and and the car goes electrically dead instantaneously. I coast to the side of the road. The doors were locked, but they un- I got out. So there you go. And I'm looking around, thinking that you know to have no idea what happens. And I open the hood, and of course, here's the one of the battery cables sort of dangling in the wind. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and it freaked me out. I had already called a tow truck because I figured something catastrophic had happened. Like how long ago was this? Now, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. It was quite a while. So, yeah. and, and I have had at least a couple of batteries, so cheap batteries explode on me in cars over the years. So. Huh. Just bad luck, I guess. All right. And that brings us to the end of our Motor Week Podcast 106. That was a lot of fun. I want to thank all of our panelists today, Brian Robinson, Ben Davis, Greg Carlos, who is actually here, Patrick Lucas. Um, I'm here, too. Also, Patrick is our <laughs> podcast producer. I want to thank Jim Bigwood for our audio engineer for making us sound intelligent today. And our podcast creator, as always, Bob Mixter. Uh, on behalf of all of us from at Motor Week, thanks very much for listening. Uh, be sure to watch Motor Week on your local public television stations as well as catch us on Velocity. And for all of us here, I'm John Davis. Be safe out there, and we'll catch you next time on Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by Die Hard. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.